Your phone, any other mobile device has been turned off because we are recording this program. Uh, we also want to make sure that you're going to be uh, comfortable in seating. If you need to use the restrooms, okay, uh, you'll need to go to the side stairways and out the back door, down the stairs, and the restrooms are to the right of the reception desk as you come in from Euclid Avenue. Okay, but we only have an hour, so I would think most of you should be able to uh, sit with us for an hour. I should go back to my first welcome, and that is uh, welcoming to two schools. We have uh, Cleveland's Facing History. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to clap for yourself, please? Facing History. All right. And we also have with us uh, Warrensville Heights High School. And again, appreciate you uh, all being here. As I mentioned, following uh, the lunch we're going to, or following the program, we're going to have lunch for you. We're going to dismiss you row at a time so that we don't crowd ourselves going down uh, the steps down to our peanut butter and jelly area uh, where we'll have pizza and uh, some beverages for you. Uh, they'll all be set for you. You take what's on the plates, and if we have enough remaining, you can come back for seconds. All right. One of the major portions of this program's interaction. So hopefully you've come with some ideas uh, with regards to questions, and perhaps you're going to do, uh, come up with some questions as we go through our program here. When it's time for questions, we would like you uh, on the right-hand side of the uh, auditorium here, and when I say right-hand side, uh, from the cameras over, we'd like you to get up, walk to the side stair and then quietly come around the back and literally form a, a queue, a line over here against the wall. Those of you who are to the left, and I'm talking my left now, uh, come over to the wall so that you don't have to really climb over too many people. The microphone is right here and we'll make sure that it's high enough for you. We'd like you to introduce yourself with just your first name and your school and then ask your question. Once your question has been answered, please return to your seat and we'll take as many questions as we can. We hope the questions will start about uh, 20 of uh, 11 and then we're gonna try and finish by five of 11. So again, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna turn the program over to uh, our host and our moderator, uh, Dee Perry. Dee? Thank you all for being here today. As John mentioned, my name is Dee Perry and I'm from IdeaStream. And I'm so glad you could be here for today's program, which begins a special series of Black History Month events presented by the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation in collaboration with Hiram College, the Cleveland History Center at Western Reserve Historical Society, and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. And uh, we are glad you're here, whether you're here with us in the Westfield Theater as our Facing History, New Tech High School, and Warrenville's, Warrensville Heights High School, or watching the WVIZ live stream as our Jane Addams Business Career Center and Shaw High School. Now, to start the program, we want you to meet some of the people who are helping to make it happen. You're gonna see welcome videos up here from uh, the Chief Executive Officer and President for WVIZ PBS Ideastream, Mr. Kevin Martin. You'll also see the President of the Board of Trustees for the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation, Mr. Mark Druckenbrod. Judy Como Hart, representing Alexander S. Taylor II of the Tacovis Foundation. Heather Terry from Dominion Energy. And Kim Manigault of the Key Bank Foundation. Let's watch. Welcome to IdeaStream's second annual Black History Month program. This year's program series is sponsored by the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation, the Tacomas Foundation, Dominion East Ohio Gas Company, and the Key Bank Foundation. Our program is originating from the Westfield Studio at the Idea Center here in Playhouse Square. Dee Perry of IdeaStream will host and moderate each program. Professors from the Hiram College will be our guest presenters for each of the four programs, and our in-house audience will consist of students from the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and other Northeast Ohio districts. Other students across Northeast Ohio will participate in the program via a live stream. Special thank you to Judy Como Hart, Mary Cromer, and Maisie Adams of the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation, and Linda Williams and John Ramacone of WVIZ Idea Stream Education Department for their behind the scenes work in creating this outstanding educational and community engagement opportunity. 
We hope you enjoyed today's program and we look forward to you participating in the programs scheduled for each Wednesday throughout the month of February. Hello, my name is Mark Druckenbrode and I am president of the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation. We are very pleased to bring you this series of lectures on prominent African Americans buried at Lakeview Cemetery. These individuals contributed economically, culturally, and civically to Northeast Ohio, the nation, and the world. We are pleased to collaborate with Hiram College, the History Center at Western Reserve Historical Society, and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. And special thanks to our sponsors, the Tacovas Foundation, Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation, and KeyBank Foundation. Black History Month has become an important part of Lakeview Cemetery's educational programming in which we promote positive examples of historical events, exemplary leaders, and progress toward social change. This month is not only deeply meaningful for the African American community, but imperative for all of us to gain a better understanding of our nation and the world. By reliving and remembering black history, we create awareness of the struggles and challenges that African Americans overcame in this country. Their perseverance serves as an inspiration for all. Every race is connected to the rich history of this nation and by celebrating Black History Month, everyone can be included in a tradition of acknowledgement, inclusion, and community engagement. Thank you for your presence today. Hello, my name is Judy Como Hart, Executive Director of the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation. On behalf of the Tacovas Foundation, I would like to read a statement from Trustee Alexander S. Taylor II, who could not be with us today, but wanted to express the Foundation's support of this project. With great honor, the Tacovas Foundation is thrilled to be the lead sponsor of this great lecture series profiling these extraordinary African Americans who greatly contributed to the civic, cultural, and economic life of Cleveland and the nation. In collaboration with the Lakeview Cemetery Foundation, Hiram College, the History Center, Western Reserve Historical Society, WVIZ PBS IdeaStream, the Key Bank Foundation, and the Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation, we believe in the importance and value of this project. Our foundation has deep roots in Cleveland, and we have always cared about the welfare of this city. We believe that people have the capacity to solve their own problems, but they often don't have access to the tools they need to make the change they seek. We are committed to helping organizations working on similar issues find each other, have productive dialogue, and work together to achieve their mutual goals. Therefore, we find value in the collaborative effort of this project to raise awareness of these magnificent African Americans who overcame many obstacles to achieve great goals in their lives. In doing so, we hope to teach you all about the promise of this country that all men and women are created equal. We hope you are inspired by their stories and moving forward in your own lives, we hope you realize all things are achievable through hard work, discipline, and perseverance. Thank you for allowing the Tacovas Foundation to be part of this great endeavor. Good morning. I am Heather Clayton Terry, Philanthropy Coordinator for Dominion Energy. It is my privilege to join with Key Bank Foundation on presenting Lakeview Cemetery's Black History Month Lecture Series. This program provides a wonderful opportunity to recognize the achievements of some truly exceptional men and women as part of our celebration of Black History Month. These contributions are important regionally, nationally, and internationally. Dominion Energy Ohio sponsor this collaboration in order to provide a unique learning experience. Through this program, we look to raise awareness of outstanding leaders and to expose students to people whose lives were both rich and diverse. It is our hope that the hundreds of participating students pay close attention to the traits and innovative methods of these heroes. Many of their attributes, including hard work, vision, integrity, and determined spirit are still vital ingredients of personal and professional success. 
Dominion Energy incorporates diversity and inclusion as a key component of our business as well, making decisions based off multiple perspectives and a range of ideas just makes sense. In fact, we host a number of employee resource groups, including an African American group, women's group, Latino group, and veterans group to celebrate workplace diversity and inclusion. We follow the guiding principles of respect, fairness, and consistency to ensure our work environment is one in which every team member is valued so that our corporate culture attracts, develops, and retains the best and brightest employees. We are a proud partner of this lecture series and look forward to continuing to serve our employees, customers, and students across the region. Thank you and enjoy today's program. Hi, my name is Kim Manigault and I am the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for KeyBank. On behalf of KeyBank and our thousands of Cleveland employees, thank you for joining us in sharing the rich history of Cleveland's notable African American leaders during Black History Month. These stories will inspire and make you think about our city and our shared culture and history. We are pleased to partner again this year with Lakeview Cemetery on this important program. Lakeview Cemetery is an historic landmark with deep roots in Cleveland's past and the extraordinary people who built this city. At Key Bank, diversity and inclusion is woven into our corporate fabric. It is reflected in our workforce, our workplace, and our marketplace. This project provides the opportunity for KeyBank to link arms across our community as we celebrate Black History Month. On behalf of my colleagues at KeyBank, I want to say we are honored to participate in this community effort as it reflects who we are as a company. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Black History Month celebration. And thanks again to everyone who made today's program possible, including you. And now we're going to hear about the history maker who's at the heart of today's event, Lethia Cousins Fleming, who was an early 20th century political activist and community organizer, and so much more. Here to share Mrs. Fleming's story is professor of history at Hiram College, Dr. Vivian Sandland. Thank you so much, Dean. I'm going to get a slide of this is a very nice uh, portrait of Lethia Cummings Fleming, Cousins Fleming, that is at the uh, Western Reserve Historical Society. And if you're interested in learning more about her or doing research into her, I encourage you to go to the Western Reserve Historical Society. So today, as Dee said, we're going to introduce you to Lethia Cousins Fleming, um, a black woman who lived in Cleveland for most of her life and who made a difference in the lives of her fellow Cleveland residents. Lethia Cousins Fleming was multi-talented and ambitious in a time when black women's opportunities were limited by race and gender discrimination. She was a teacher. She was a political activist. She was a social worker. She was a reformer. She was an advocate for children and for the elderly and for the poor. She was a leading activist in the Republican Party, which may seem unusual to you, um, but we're going to talk about her, why she was so active in the Republican Party. She was also the spouse of Cleveland's first black city councilor, Thomas W. Fleming. And she was among the prominent African Americans who contributed to building the black community in 20th century Cleveland. So learning about her life opens for us a window into African American life in Cleveland, especially in the early days decades of the 20th century, but all through the 20th century. Her life also reveals to us how black women in particular work to serve their community and to shape the possibility for African Americans in the city. So Lethia Cousins was born in 1876 in Tazewell, Virginia, in what was becoming the segregated South at the end of Reconstruction. You may have studied Reconstruction to high school students and this period after the Civil War. Um, and this was a time when the hopes and dreams of African Americans for freedom and equality in the South 
were being largely dashed, taken away after Reconstruction. The Northern commitment to enforce racial equality in the Southern states had waned, and by 1877, federal troops were removed from the South, ending Reconstruction and ending the, gov the federal government's support for equality. White supremacy was restored throughout the region. African Americans across the South were subject to segregation laws and were denied the vote through poll taxes and literacy tests and grandfather clauses that required a man's grandfather to have voted in order for him to have the right to vote. The brief period after the Civil War when the nation moved just a little bit in the direction of racial equality was over and the South became the Jim Crow South. Virginia, as a former slave state, imposed segregation by law on its people. Virginia's segregated public school system was created in 1870, and Lethia attended a segregated primary school. Her parents, James Archibald Cousins and Fanny Taylor Cousins, then moved to Ironton, Ohio, just across the Ohio River where Lethia attended high school. Now, Ironton had been founded in 1849 by men of the Ohio Iron and Coal Company, and the town became a center of the iron industry until the iron ran out and iron was replaced by steel. Before the Civil War, the city had been a stop for fugitive slaves who crossed the Ohio River from Kentucky and Virginia. Underground railroad conductors reportedly lived in Ironton and helped the fugitives on their journey northward to Canada. There were only 32 African Americans living in Ironton, Ohio in 1863, according to the Lawrence Register. Ironton continued to have a small African American population after the Civil War ended. Ohio did not require segregated schools, but schools in Ohio were allowed to segregate students by race until 1887, when the law changed. Lethia Cousins thus did her early studies in a mixed school of African American and white students. Cousins returned to the South for college, to the historically black Morristown College in Tennessee. Morristown began as a school for newly freed slaves in 1868. It expanded, and in 1881, Morristown was turned into a cemetery to prepare ministers, as well as a normal college to prepare teachers to serve African American communities, normal colleges or teachers' colleges. And Lethia Cousins studied to be a teacher. In the early 20th century, influenced by African-American leader Booker T. Washington, Morristown introduced industrial education and changed its name to Morristown Industrial and Normal College. Women in the industrial program learned domestic science, meaning cooking, sewing, and serving techniques. Men learned woodworking, carpentry, broom making, and agricultural techniques. Morristown finally closed because of low enrollment and financial problems in 1994, which is sad. Well, after her graduation from Morristown College, Lethia Cousins returned to Virginia, and she worked as a teacher in the segregated black schools in Virginia and West Virginia for more than a decade. She also became an activist for women's suffrage. Suffrage means votes, votes for women during this time. Now, we know little else of her life during this period except that she met a man named Thomas Wallace Fleming, who was a resident of Cleveland. She and Fleming married on February 21st, 1912. It was his second marriage and her first. The couple then settled in Cleveland in the city's Central Avenue neighborhood where Thomas lived. Now, Thomas Fleming was born in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and he moved to Cleveland in 1893 at the age of 19 to work as a barber. At night, he attended Cleveland Law School, and he passed the bar in 1906. Thomas became a protege of a man named Harry Clay Smith, a black Republican politician and the founder of a black newspaper called the Cleveland Gazette. The northern cities were really rich with African-American newspapers in this period. And Smith inspired Fleming and two other men to found their own African-American newspaper, the Cleveland Journal, 
in 1903. So Fleming was really an, kind of an ambitious entrepreneur who founded his own newspaper. Now, African American men were allowed to vote in Ohio beginning in 1870, and most black voters were Republicans. Now, this is because of their continuing allegiance to the party of Lincoln since the Civil War and Reconstruction. The Republicans, as you will recall from history classes, had led the Union to victory in the Civil War. And the Republicans had also authored and pushed through constitutional amendments that abolished slavery and aimed to guarantee African Americans equal rights under the law. <clears throat> the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment ensured that African Americans were recognized as citizens and prohibited states from denying due process of law and the equal protection of the laws to any person. Well, they didn't actually do that for about 100 years, but that was the intention. And the 15th Amendment prohibited states from denying the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, the 15th Amendment did not prohibit states from denying the right to vote to women. And Ohio did not allow women full voting rights in the early 20th century. Um, women had some partial voting rights, such as for school board elections, because people thought, well, women deal with schools, so women can vote for the, in those elections. Um, but black men in Ohio could vote and run for office. And so Thomas Fleming became active in the Republican Party in Cleveland, and he sought to organize black Republican voters. In 1907, Thomas Fleming ran for the Cleveland City Council. He did not win, but it was for him a start in local politics. He was elected to the City Council in 1909, but then he lost his bid for re-election in 1911. And then, of course, in 1912, he met Lethia Cousins, who then moved to Cleveland. And the couple lived on East 40th Street in the Central Avenue neighborhood. Now, at the time, the central neighborhood was racially and ethnically mixed, with many Jewish and Italian immigrants living near a growing population of African Americans. The schools at this time were not segregated, but as the century unfolded, most institutions in the city became segregated, and African Americans faced significant discrimination in employment and housing and in access to health care and other services. Lethia Cousins Fleming arrived in Cleveland in this changing environment. At the time, as I said, women did not have the vote in Ohio, and the women's suffrage movement was in full swing. Scholars call the early 20th century the progressive era, and women's suffrage was a leading cause among progressive reformers. Progressives organized to bring about improvements in many areas. They supported labor organizing and labor unions. They worked to improve conditions for the poor, particularly for immigrants in cities. They challenged big corporations, and they worked for laws to provide more democratic access to ordinary people. Progressives were active in both major parties, both the Republican and Democratic parties. Progressive women in this period organized women's clubs, and African-American women organized black women's clubs. This was called the Black Women's Club Movement. These clubs were mostly led by elite black women who sought to uplift their poorer black sisters. They relied on the self-help ideas of Booker T. Washington, who called on African-Americans to work hard, learn industrial trades, succeed economically, and not challenge segregation laws directly. Washington and those who embraced this tradition believed that by being economically successful, African Americans would demonstrate that they were equal to whites and deserving of legal, political, and social equality. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, as it was called, adopted as their motto, lifting as we climb. They sought to lift up their poorer black sisters by example as they themselves gradually achieved equal status and equal rights with white people. Lethia Cousins Fleming embraced the self-help tradition and she also advocated for and engaged in political activism herself. Like her husband, Lethia sought to organize black women as Republicans, though they could not yet vote in most elections in Ohio in 1912. 
In October 1914, Lethia was one of a few black women who marched in a women's suffrage parade in downtown Cleveland. More than 10,000 Cleveland women marched down Euclid Avenue in front of 200,000 spectators. They marched to support a proposed women's suffrage amendment to the Ohio State Constitution. It would have given Ohio women full voting rights. Progressive activists, black and white, saw winning the right to vote as crucial for bringing about social changes that would improve conditions for the poor and socially marginalized. They believed that when women won the vote, they would vote for candidates who supported progressive reforms. That didn't really happen, at least not at first, but that was the hope. But the proposed Ohio Women's Suffrage Amendment was defeated at the polls in November 1914 by a 20-point margin. Only 39.3% of Ohio voters supported women's suffrage. Now, African-American women's participation in the women's suffrage movement was not welcomed by all white women. In the National Women's Suffrage Parade a year earlier in 1913, Southern white women refused to march if black women were allowed to participate. Black women did not back down, however, and they marched. And many white women insisted that if black women were allowed to be visible in the movement, Southern white men would refuse to support a federal constitutional amendment to guarantee women the vote nationwide. But black women, by their presence and their activism, did not allow themselves to be excluded. Lethia Cousins Fleming was one of the activist women who refused to be pushed out of the movement for women's voting rights because of racial prejudice. In that same year, 1914, Lethia Cousins Fleming took over as chair of the Board of Lady Managers of the Cleveland Home for Aged Colored People. This home had been created in 1893 by a woman named Eliza Bryant, and she was the daughter of a slave woman and her master. Bryant spent her early years living on a slave plantation in North Carolina. Her mother was freed in 1848 and moved to Cleveland with the family. And Eliza Bryant came to recognize the difficulties facing African Americans moving from the South to Cleveland, especially elderly people who had been slaves and who had no family and no means of supporting themselves. Black people then were excluded from Cleveland's homeless shelters and were left with nowhere to go. In 1893, Bryant set out to start a home for the black elderly, and she recruited community groups and churches to contribute. The oil millionaire John D. Rockefeller made a contribution that enabled them to buy their first house. Eliza Bryant died in 1907, but her home for the elderly survived. And in 1960, it was renamed the Eliza Bryant Home, and it is today called Eliza Bryant Village. When she arrived in Cleveland, Lethia Cousins Fleming threw herself into the work of supporting this home and of overseeing its management, and she made enormous contributions to the success of, the, uh, of this home. Well, on the eve of World War I, Cleveland had about 10,000 African American residents. Most lived in the Central Avenue neighborhood. And as the population of African Americans grew, conditions for them worsened. Race discrimination prevented black people from receiving services that were open to white immigrants. Hospitals kept African Americans segregated and refused to allow black doctors to practice there. Restaurants and hotels and theaters refused to cater to African Americans. The industries that had grown up in and around Cleveland, the steel mills and foundries refused to hire African Americans. Labor unions also refused to admit African Americans. The black newcomers to the city were forced to work mostly in service jobs that paid little, and they feared moving out of the increasingly black central neighborhood. They feared violence. Well, US entry into the Great War, which is what World War I was called at the time, drew industrial workers into the army. And suddenly, northern industries needed more workers, and they began to seek out black workers from the south. Thus began the great migration of African Americans out of the south to the industrial north in search of job opportunities and the opportunity to vote. 
Hundreds of thousands of African Americans left sharecropping work in Alabama and moved to Cleveland. In fact, Cleveland came to be known as Alabama North. The population of the Central Avenue neighborhood expanded rapidly, and the city's black population grew from 1.6% of the city total before the war to 4.3% by 1920. And by 1930, 72,000 African Americans lived in Cleveland. In 1915, Thomas Fleming ran again for the Cleveland City Council from the 11th Ward, and he won. And he wound up serving on the council continuously until 1929, and he became a very significant and powerful figure uh, among African Americans in the city and in the Republican Party. Lithia too, Lithia too was active in politics, and she became a featured speaker in the area. Now, here's an interesting little fact, and it actually relates to this day. In February 1917, she went to Pittsburgh, where she gave the keynote address at the centennial anniversary of the birth of the former slave and famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Now, Douglass was never sure exactly when he was born. And we aren't even 100% sure what year he was born. Many today think he was born in um, 1818, not 1817. And he chose this day, February 14th, to be the day he marked as his birthday. So today is Frederick Douglass's chosen birthday. Happy 200th birthday to Frederick Douglass. <laughs> And, and Lethea Fleming was able to give this keynote address because she was becoming so well known. Well, after women won the vote nationwide in 1920 with a constitutional amendment, Lethea Fleming became a significant voice in the Ohio Republican Party by promoting party candidates. In an open letter in 1920, she urged black women to support the presidential candidacy of Warren Harding of Ohio and his running mate, Calvin Coolidge, and of course they won. She wrote, we as colored women have prayed for a better day, a day when we would be in a position to demand fair play and an equal chance. We must not now neglect the opportunity given to us to serve the party of Lincoln, McKinley, and Roosevelt meaning Theodore Roosevelt. Lethia Fleming also assumed leadership roles in various organizations on the national and local levels. She served as president of the Ohio Federation of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, and she was elected chair of the executive board of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She also directed the National Association of Colored Republican Women, which focused specifically on organizing Republicans. And she supported the Negro Welfare League, which later was renamed the Urban League. And she belonged to the Cleveland branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. Lethia Cousins Fleming also supported the Phyllis Wheatley Association, which served young black women in Cleveland. The PWA was founded originally as the Working Girls Association by another black activist named Jane Edna Hunter. And she started the PWA as a boarding house for young single women, similar to the YWCA, which admitted only white girls. Hunter disliked the Republican political machine and certain businessmen in the city, especially an entrepreneur named Albert Boyd, who was also called Starlight for a bar he owned. And he was a friend of Thomas Fleming's. Hunter called Starlight the great mogul of organized vice. And she accused Starlight of being a pimp who ran brothels and saloons in the central neighborhood and who paid off Thomas Fleming to allow the vice to continue. Uh, this was probably true. Um, she was probably right about that. And in this decade of prohibition of alcohol, Thomas Fleming used his power to enable saloon owners to prosper, which was very controversial. Hunter, appalled by what she saw as the vice and depravity in the 11th Ward, worked unsuccessfully to defeat Thomas Fleming in the city council race in 1919. 
Um, despite Hunter's campaign to unseat her husband, Lethia Cousins Fleming never turned against her. She remained a member of the Phyllis Wheatley Association, and she raised money to help buy a new building for the association. And this impressive new building opened in 1927. It enabled the association to provide classes and social activities to an expanded number of young women in the city. Lethia was always the diplomat, reaching out even to her husband's rivals to bring about improvements to the African-American community of Cleveland. Her husband ran a powerful political machine. She remained the dedicated reformer. Lethia Fleming even organized a dinner in 1933 to honor Jane Edna Hunter. And she continued to work to organize for Republicans um, she worked to mobilize black voters to support Herbert Hoover for president in 1928. Well, Thomas Fleming, her husband, believed in investing in the black community and in using his political power to promote both the black community and his own interests. He bought a realty company in 1919 to buy and rent properties in the Central Avenue neighborhood. And this move certainly added to the couple's wealth. He used his position on the city council to provide municipal jobs for African Americans, and he got higher pay for African Americans who worked in city jobs. He introduced an ordinance to build a public bathhouse. He built a gymnasium and a swimming pool in the Central Avenue area. He also got the city council to bar the Ku Klux Klan from marching in Cleveland. The Flemings, husband and wife, were two of Cleveland's most influential and wealthy black citizens in the 1920s. And Thomas and Lethia took a cruise ship to Europe in 1927, where they toured England and the continent. Well, when they got home, the Flemings' good fortune ran out. This is a very sad story. The incident involved a former police detective named Walter Ohm who had been severely injured on the job and could barely walk. He and his wife were living on a small monthly pension check. Ohm had asked Thomas Fleming to get the city to pay his medical bills, and Fleming had done so. After Fleming's trip to Europe, the detective and his wife went to see Fleming, and Ohm handed Thomas Fleming a check for $200. A year and a half passed. One night, in early 1929, Thomas Fleming was confronted by reporters from the Cleveland Plain Dealer who asked if he had shaken Ohm down for the money. Fleming denied the accusation, daring them to find the check. The next morning, the newspaper declared, crippled policeman says he paid Fleming $200 after council action. When Ohm produced a canceled $200 check, Fleming was indicted on charges of soliciting and accepting a bribe. He argued in court that Ohm had merely asked him to cash a check for him. His trial lasted for three days. The all-white jury found Thomas Fleming guilty of accepting a bribe. Fleming resigned his position on the city council, insisting that he was innocent. He went to prison for 27 months. Lethia Fleming appealed to the governor to pardon her husband, but he refused. And Lethia herself was briefly considered to replace Thomas on the city council, but she was not appointed. Fleming's minister was appointed to the position instead. Well, Thomas Fleming's political career was over, and he wrote a memoir that was never pub published called My Rise and Persecution, in which he blamed the Ku Klux Klan and the Democrats and the Plain Dealer for his conviction. He said he had been framed. Thomas Fleming's health soon failed. He suffered two cerebral hemorrhages, and he died in 1948. Lethia Cousins Fleming was clearly shaken by her husband's conviction and prison sentence, and she supported him throughout his ordeal. She continued her work on behalf of Republican candidates and on behalf of the African American community of Cleveland. The Cleveland Plain Dealer in 1929 described her as a power among the women voters of the third district and a Republican party leader of recognized ability. Lethia remained a dedicated Republican long after most African American voters had embraced the Democratic party during and after the Great Depression. 
Lethia Cousins Fleming served for 20 years on the County Child Welfare Board, which is today Child and Family Services. She retired in 1951, and her colleagues and the agency supervisor shown here, Ethel Minig, honored her with a T. She was a trustee of the Mount Zion Congregational Church, and she also wrote that she was drawn to the Baha'i faith. She died in 1963 at the age of 86, and she is buried in Lakeview Cemetery. The life of Lethia Cousins Fleming spanned many decades of change for African Americans in the South and in Cleveland. She lived first in the segregated South and then in Cleveland when race discrimination was the common experience of African Americans in this city. She lived through decades when women first gained the right to vote and began to assert political power. She learned to use the opportunities and the influence and resources available to her to make life better for African Americans and for the poor and marginalized in Cleveland. Despite the ba barriers and setbacks she faced, Lethia Cousins Fleming persisted and spoke out and used her gifts to serve others. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Sandland. And what happens now is that you in the audience have a chance to ask questions about Lethia Cousins Fleming and the times in which she lived and what she accomplished. If you have a question here in the studio, you can step up to the microphone uh, that is right there where John Ramacoman is standing. And um, to get us started until someone steps up, um, I, I have a question about um, Lethia Cumin, Cum, Cousins Fleming's early years, she, she seems to have come to Cleveland and jumped right into activism, but are there any indications of, of how, she, how she was shaped that way, how she came to be the person um, that she ended up being? That's a really good question. I mean, we don't know a lot about her early years, but I think that her experiences as a teacher in the segregated South made a real difference for her. She saw that she could shape, influence young minds and that people could grow and become active in making social change. And I think it was that experience. And I mean, Cleveland was segregated too, de facto segregation, um, but it was different. Um, it was a kind of a different kind of segregation. And I think she was she came to believe as a teacher from working with young people that young people could be encouraged and taught to go out and, and really remake the world. Yeah. Another thing I was wondering about was the clubs that you mentioned. Um, she was a very active club woman and, and you said the, the mission of those women's clubs, black women's clubs in particular, were to uplift their poorer sisters, but I wondered how that happened. I mean, just by example doesn't seem I know. enough because they didn't right. really move in the same circles. That's right. I think that was, um, well, African-Americans at the time, men and women, were looking for ways to improve conditions for and, and give provide more opportunities for African-Americans without people being lynched and killed. Um, and without, you know, it was very dangerous, particularly in the South, but everywhere really, to challenge the kind of existing racist order, social order. And so the idea of kind of moving up, you know, lifting as we climb, rising economically and socially um, was a way that seemed, it enabled people to avoid being killed and, um, I'm not sure how well it worked, but that was, you know, there was a lot of funding available. You know, the Rockefellers and other um, wealthy donors gave money to causes like this. Hmm. And you, you mentioned that she and her husband lived in the central neighborhood and um, by design, but also by de facto segregation. Yes, it, it, right. It really was, um, 
You know, there wasn't a law saying African Americans had to live in that neighborhood, but the idea of moving out of the neighborhood, that would have been dangerous, and people realized it, and so the neighborhood became more and more crowded. Now, she and her husband did very well financially, and so they lived in a very nice home, and there were some beautiful homes in that area, but, but gradually it became more and more crowded, and um, conditions really deteriorated. Mm -hmm. One question I think people might ask is the question, was Thomas Fleming guilty? I was <laughs> you were going to ask that question, yeah. right? I don't know. I mean, maybe not, right? He insisted that he was set up and that really what was behind this was his opposition to the Ku Klux Klan, which may very well have been true. But I, I don't know how we would uncover that. Right. And I think we have someone at the microphone with a question. Oh. <laughs> did, did Lathia ever have kids? No. She and Thomas did not have any children. Thomas had children by his previous marriage, but they never had children. That's a good question, though. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and also interesting because she spent so many years working for children and families. Yes, and I think that, um, you know, one can devote one's life to children even without having children of one's own. I think we yeah. see that in her case. That's a really, I mean, her commitment to other people was just so strong, you know, to the community, to, to really to the African-American community. Uh, a question with regards to uh, uh, teaching. Did does she actually have a, uh, a teaching degree from Morristown, and did she teach uh, in the Cleveland schools? No, she did not teach in the Cleveland schools, but she taught in schools across the South. But she did get a degree from Morristown. Um, it's very sad that Morristown no longer exists, right? We like to keep the, some of these historically black colleges, um, at least in our memory, right? We have a, I think we have another question. Uh, is the Lonnie Burton Recreation Center the one that Thomas Fleming uh, opened? Is the Lonnie Burton Recreation Center one that Thomas Fleming opened? Probably. I'm not sure, but that's a really good question. Probably. He, um, he really uh, got the city council to put money into the neighborhood, right? to the community. And he was very successful at that. And it's sad that he's not remembered for those contributions because I think I, my only guess is that people are embarrassed because he went to prison. But we don't even know if he was really guilty, right? right. <laughs> we just know the, that he was, you know, found guilty. Yeah, and but he did a lot of activism for the people in, yes. in his community. Yes, he definitely did a lot of activism for the people in the community. And, you know, it, he was viewed as a controversial figure because of his, you know, he was also a lawyer and he would go to court and defend saloon owners at a time when, this was prohibition, right? And so you couldn't have a saloon. And he would work to get them off, and he was viewed as controversial for that reason. But he really promoted black entrepreneurship, right? That was a, a major focus of both of the Flemings was black entrepreneurship, even if it was illegal in the case of saloons at the time, which are not illegal now, right? Another question? Hello. Mr. Ali from Warrensville Heights. Uh, I want to make some connections to today. We speak of uh, successful movements such as the women's suffrage movement. Uh, today it almost seems so obvious that would be a, a progressive move to make. Yeah. When we look at Mrs. Fleming's story as a, as a source of inspiration, what do you think the next big move is? We see some movements today trying to progress the African American community and we see it done in different ways. Um, and I think even some of those ways are looking for a specific direction through things like Black Lives Matter and, mm -hmm. and what have you. What do you, think your, what do you think the next move would be? Oh, is it, historians don't usually predict the future. My father used to say, you're a wimp. You never make any predictions. <laughs> I'd say, I'm a historian. We study the past, <laughs> right? Um, well, I don't know, Dee, what do you think of the next movement? And I'll think about that a little bit. Um, I, I feel like needs to be around education and entrepreneurship, um, marrying those two things, because I still think there, it, 
it's easier today to, to get a foothold because of social media, but it's still a struggle to get the education that you need, the connections that you need to to build something that that's that's really yours and, yes. and make it grow. So I, I feel like um, there's there's a missing link there that needs to to have that connection between uh, mentors, students, and entrepreneurship. And another questioner. Well, speaking on growth, like. Was it like a legacy that she probably left behind, like a journal or like a primary source, like anything like that? She did not write um, a sort of an autobiography, which is sad. Um, Thomas wrote his um, sort of dis explain. Well, it was kind of an autobiographical story, but it ended with the uh, the his being prosecuted and gone to prison. So he called it my rise and persecution. But there are her papers, there, there are a lot of documents and papers about her at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Some of them are you know, minute books and meeting minutes and that kind of thing. But you can learn a lot about her from reading those and anybody can go and access those and read the primary sources about Lethia Cousins Fleming. Great. Um, it's about like, when Thomas Fleming was accused to be guilty, like, would they have, just because it was an all-white jury, that's the reason why he went away? Well, he was also on counsel, so yeah. they've probably been trying to get him out for the, a while. Well, you know, we'd have to go back through the trial records there. And, <laughs> and, and that's interesting. I wonder if those transcripts are also at the Western Reserve they, Historical there Society. Is a, a body of Thomas Fleming papers at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Those might be there. Um, the wife of the detective said that she saw um, the exchange of money. Now, Thomas Fleming said, though, that there was an exchange of money, but that, that it wasn't a bribe. So, you know, I don't know how, you know, how strong that evidence was, but it would be interesting to go through, well, since my focus was her, not him, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at that trial, but that would be a really interesting research project to look at what happened to Thomas Fleming and why he was convicted. Right. And, and an interesting thing is happening at that time, as you were talking about, there weren't that many black people in the early part of the 20th century, but around the late 20s and into the 30s, tens of thousands of black people were coming up from the South, right. and the more who arrived, the more restrictive the, the laws became, the yes. housing became, yes. everything, the, the mixing that right. had gone on earlier right. stopped. The conditions so got worse, mm -hmm. and the segregation got worse as more African Americans were arriving, and so there was more, really, repression. Yes, another Good question. Good morning, my name is Lisbeth. I'm from Warrensville Heights High School. Um, I have a question, being that she paved the way for there to be activism because she was an activist, being that you spend a lot of time with youth, um, what is your advice for us to be more active? Because she was a female, so now I'm a female, so seeing what she did, what is your advice for us to be more active now, 2018? I think voting and organizing voters and organizing people to vote and to really build a movement is essential. I, I'm sometimes shocked when I hear that people who turn 18 don't bother to vote because people fought and died for the right to vote. You know, African American men weren't given the right to vote in the South after the 15th Amendment was ratified. It was stripped away from them with, you know, poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. Women weren't given the right to vote nationwide until 1920, and it, this was, um, you know, after you know 75 years of struggle to win the right to vote. And I think that, I think we just can't, people cannot give up, right? People cannot give up on being involved because one thing she did, she never gave up her activism. You know, through her entire life, she was an activist. She never just said, oh. Oh, we are going to lose. Forget it. She never did that. She persisted. She found new and innovative ways to make a difference. And I think 
that's what young people need to do is to really say, okay, we're, we're you know, somebody might say, well, I don't really like this president. I'm not commenting on President Trump, but I'm saying somebody might say, I don't like this president. So I'm just going to give up and crawl into a hole. And we really just can't do that. We have to, uh, people need to, if you have a commitment to make change, you have to look for different ways to do it. But I think that engaging in politics and voting is really, and running for office. We're seeing lots of people that have never run for office before running for office. So why don't you run for office? Why don't you run for the Cleveland City Council? <laughs> well, um, it's baby steps, right? Baby step, right. <laughs> thank you for stepping up to the microphone. Yeah, thank you. That was a really great question. Yeah. So to piggyback off what Mr. Ali said, uh, with the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement, um, being that females are now fighting for pay equity, what is, how can I inform this? Um, I forgot how I was going to ask you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, is there any way that we can find what she did or how she surrounded herself? Because she was active. But for me, being my lack of knowledge on who can I surround myself to get to that point and bring the all the ignorance that is there, bring it to the light of the knowledge of being able to become aware of things. Who do I surround myself with or where do I go? Does she leave anything behind? Like, Well, her community of activists, and this is kind of interesting to people now because it's so different now, but her community was the Republican Party activists of that time and also the kind of progressive woman suffrage activists of that time. Um, and uh, I think now there are all kinds of groups that have organized. I mean, uh, indivisible groups, and um, I think that there are, you know, if you're going to college, there are student groups you could join and be active. I think it's your question reflects an assumption that's really important, that you want to work in a community. You don't want to just be all alone, mm -hmm. that it's important to work in community. Dee, did you have a thought on that? And, and I was just thinking it's easier to find information now than yes. ever, and, and I, I would just um, look up women's activist groups in Cleveland, and, and I bet um, a list of things would pop up, um, or, or uh, college activism, or high school activism, um, just typing something into a search engine can get you started, and then um, reaching out to those people and saying, um, you may not have time to be my mentor, but could you point me in the direction? What are some things asking, specifically asking for advice? And, and believe me, um, people of um, our age and, and um, anywhere in between are looking for young people who really want to get involved, who really want to have a voice, because we worry about what the next generation is going to do and how they're going to do it. So, so the sooner you get started, the better. Yeah, at Hiram College, we have a group, African American Students United, but it's open to people of any race mm -hmm. because that's the way Hiram is. And right. you can get involved in, you can get involved in, there are women's groups. This is true in all colleges and high schools too, I think. Yeah. We have time for just one more question. Okay, so my question is what inspired Lynthia to get involved with the African community the way that she did? What inspired Lethia to get involved with the African American community in the way that she did? I think that it, she had a, a commitment from early on in her girlhood to working for the betterment of African Americans through education and self-help. I mean, that was really important. When she met Thomas, she saw the significance of politics and using political influence to make a difference. So I think it was really the people she surrounded herself with and the influences in her early life when she saw how much African Americans could um, become active and inspired as a result of education. I think education, even though she didn't stay a teacher, I think being a teacher had a huge impact on her. Yeah, so value education is the, right. is the small password. Thank you all for, for being Thank part you. of this educational Thank you experience. So much.
And I should mention that we're doing it again next Wednesday. Um, the focus will be on another community activist who was really a powerful role model for the Huff neighborhood. Um, Councilperson Fannie Lewis will be the focus for next week. For today, um, enjoy your lunch and travel safely.